Welcome to Stay Grounded with your host, me, Raj Jana. I'm the founder of Java Press Coffee Company, and my life changed after my mentor died with three months left until retirement. That experience inspired me to start a personal journey to discover how we can all live a purpose-driven and meaningful life starting today. I interview everyone from best-selling authors and business moguls to extreme athletes and monks to discuss happiness, success, and fulfillment to uncover powerful takeaways that empower you to stay grounded and make passionate living a reality. To access post-podcast discussions, insights, and further resources, visit rajjana.com forward slash stay grounded. So thanks for joining me today. Now, let's get to grinding. Yo, yo, welcome to episode 68 of Stay Grounded. Hope you guys are having a great start to your day so far. I'm really excited to be introducing this week's guest, Mr. Andy Storch. So I actually recorded this episode a little while back, but I wanted to time it with the start of a brand new quarter so that you guys can get inspired and ready to continue your journey of growth. So Andy is a consultant, coach, and facilitator who helps people do the best work of their lives by enhancing their overall performance. So he's worked with a huge range of clients, including Google, Red Bull, Sony, Toyota, and as well as small businesses and startup CEOs. So Andy's super passionate about leadership development, self-improvement, and using learning as a tool to get the max out of your life. And that's what I love most about Andy, actually. He's such a self-learner and such a committed human being to the pursuit of personal development that I personally found it really refreshing to have a great conversation about learning with him. Uh, I read a ton. I am constantly learning and growing, but I don't know everything. And Andy was definitely there to, to fill in a lot of the blanks on things that I felt uh, were really important on what you can do to live a fulfilling life through the art of learning. So we cover everything from the unexpected power of teaching to our own personal development journey, how failure can become an asset that actually increases your confidence, how to differentiate between different sorts of fear so you don't get stopped in your way, and the real reason why you learn more when you're surrounded by like-minded people. I've always believed that it's not necessarily the people you surround yourself with, it's the people you learn from. And Andy is definitely someone that I learned from on this episode, and I can't wait for you guys to also experience the brilliance that Andy shares over the next hour. Anyways, uh, but before we get started, if you haven't already, subscribe to us on any of the podcast apps. My favorite is iTunes. All that means is every single time we release a new episode, it drops right into your phone so you can enjoy it as it's ready. And uh, enjoy. Really, guys, this is for you. Uh, This was a really refreshing episode from somebody who practices everything he preaches. And I'm just really excited for you guys to discover the specific strategies that Andy uses to commit to his personal journey of learning. So anyways, hope you guys enjoy this episode. But without further ado, here is the man, Andy Storch. Yo, 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 welcome back to another episode of Stay Grounded. I'm your host, Raj, and what's going on, Mr. Andy Stewart? Raj, so good to see you, man, and I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on your show today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, man, I uh, we were just talking about this earlier, but I don't remember where I heard a conversation that you were having with someone else, and what triggered that to say, hey, I need to have you on my show. And I'm just really grateful that you said yes. So hey, all in all, man. I think, a lot of gratitude. Here we are. I think, yeah, it's a circle of gratitude. We'll, we'll let that start us off. So anyways, I already intro to you before the show started. So we'll dive right in. I think what I find most fascinating about you is just you've worked with so many top performers and you've helped people become top performers in so many ways. Yeah. What do you think about the learning process? Like what about the learning process do you think top performers sort of follow versus any other type of a performer? Well, I I'm, I like that you said learning. And I think that uh, one of the things I've discovered as I've been working with a lot of leaders and big companies and entrepreneurs and getting into this journey myself of improving and, and growing my own business is that probably heard the saying, leaders are learners and leaders are readers. You know, most CEOs read 50 books a year, which is surprising because, you know, they're, they're, a typical big company executive is like back to back in meetings all the time. Yeah. But they all make time for learning. That's kind of the common theme that I find, you know, in the corporate world, it's a lot more reading. And then of course, a lot of big companies will invest 
uh, tons of money in learning and development, which is actually where I come in. My main business is connecting companies with really great learning solutions. So I, I you know, at the at the core, I sell and run training and development. But as I have gotten deep into entrepreneurial communities. I started a podcast a year and a half ago on entrepreneurship, interviewing entrepreneurs who are doing great things. One of the biggest common themes is that they are curious and constantly looking for ways to learn and grow and get better and investing in themselves. Mm-hmm. And what's different about that from probably the, the general population is they're willing to invest in themselves beyond traditional education. So a lot of people invest in themselves in, in that they'll go get a college degree, maybe even a grad degree. I have an MBA, so I invested a, a ton of money there. But then to continue investing in books and seminars and coaching and other types of training and certifications, you see that from the top performers uh, almost across the board. And uh, it, it, it's very motivating. It makes you think, okay, I need to keep learning too, because the world is changing, right? And here we are in 2018, the rate of change has never been faster and yep. it's only getting faster. And we have to keep learning to keep up. And if you think you've got it figured out, eventually you're going to get disrupted, whether you're a person or you're a company, and you're, you're going to fall behind. So they really have to keep learning. Yeah. What about learning? So I'm a, I'm a huge, I'm an avid reader and learner myself, but I've also found that some of the biggest lessons and breakthroughs I've had have not just come from books, but also experiential learning or even emotional learning and, and building self-awareness and putting myself in in challenging situations and seeing how I thrive. What balance of learning do you see works best? Yeah, I think that you're, you're really onto something there because there's certainly a lot of learning that can be done from reading books, listening to podcasts like this. Uh, and I read a lot of books too, but I will openly admit that I probably, you know, every book I read, I probably pull one or two things, you know, maybe 10% stays with me because it's a lot, it's passive, right? The, the programs that I run for companies are generally experiential learning programs. So I believe that people learn best through experiences, which is why if you look at you know, sports teams or the military, they spend a lot of time not in the classroom learning. They do, you know, football teams watch film and they do look at what the other players are doing. But then what do they do? They go out on the field and they practice because yeah. they're learning from trying different things and seeing what happens and then going and making adjustments. And that's also why you hear, especially within the startup culture or anybody that's big on the growth mindset, that you know failure is great, right? You want to fail fast, fail often, even though it's scary as hell, because we learn so much from those failures and it's so important to get out and try things. So I think when you ask about the balance or the blend, my general advice you know, for a lot of people and the thing I try to do is, is read and listen to podcasts and do different things to learn stuff, but then you got to go practice it. You got to go try those things because that's where you're going to learn if it actually works and it, it's going to be reinforced. If you don't go practice it, then you're probably not, it's not going to stick with you. It's not going to be reinforced. You, you're going to learn through that experience uh, for the most part. And then the next level beyond that is if you're practicing it, you're putting things you know, into practice, go and teach others. Right? That's kind of like the highest part. So once you've figured it out, you teach others. Not only are you helping other people, but it's reinforcing it again within you. So I'd learn a ton of stuff from following people like you and others. And then I'll try some of that stuff. And then I'll talk about it on my podcast or in conversations with other people when I'm coaching them or whatever it is, and keep teaching. And it's kind of almost like the circle of, of learning and growth that goes on. And that's how we all get better. I love that, man. And but I think that there's also like a space between learning, doing and then teaching and that's failing. And so I think most people don't do because of a fear of failure, or wherever that comes in. What is your own relationship with failure and what have you seen works well to sort of rewire the mindset uh, or the relationship towards failure? Personally, I spent most of my life being afraid of failure and afraid of rejection. Uh, I I dealt with that a lot. Uh, I think I grow up, you know, for anybody that is a fan of the book Mindset by Carol Dweck, which had a big impact on me, I think I grew up mostly with a fixed mindset. I was, I did very well in school. Uh, But I think part of that was always like fear driven. I was afraid of failing, right? But then because of that, I I wouldn't take as many chances. And I was able to change that, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And it's not that I'm still not afraid of failure. I don't think that we're ever going to stop being afraid of those things. But the thing about fear that I've learned is that as we do things more, you practice, like you said, you try stuff and you fail then you build up that experience and the experience builds up confidence 
And then the confidence helps the fear to almost kind of erode away. Mm -hmm. So there may be some things that you do, like you host this podcast, probably the first time you turned on the mic, you were probably scared of like, okay, what the heck oh, yeah. <laughs> is going to happen? What are people going to think of me, right? And now that you've done it, you know, many, many times as I have, it's comfortable to just, you know, turn the mic on and start talking. And the other example I like to give is I've, I've been studying lately under a, a former Navy SEAL named Larry Yach. He's a paratrooper. He's jumped out of planes thousands of times. And maybe the first time he jumped out of a plane, he was scared. I personally have still never gone skydiving. I would like to do it one day. And I know when I do, I'm going to be terrified. When he jumps out of a plane, he's not scared because he's done it many, many times because he's built up that experience, which led to confidence. And you know, the failure again eroded away. So I think for me, at least, one of the biggest keys when you, you see something that you want to do, but you're scared to do it, is to recognize that fear and then do it anyway, which I know is not the, the most amazing advice, but if you just do it, try it and get that experience, then do it again, you'll learn from it. And usually after you know, a couple of times, you realize, oh, this is not bad. You know, people are not judging me like I thought they were you know, when I was going to start this podcast or yeah. you know, you're, you're going to, I know you're going to go do some stand up comedy soon. Yeah. And I know it's, it's, it's terrifying to go up there on that stage, but if you did that, you'll do it this time and it'll go, okay, no one will throw tomatoes at you. Right. And if you do it again, you do it again. Eventually, you know, I'm guessing most stand up comedians that are, that are out there that have kind of quote, made it, they probably still get nervous because they want to perform well, but they're probably not as terrified as they were the first time they went up. Well, that's the beautiful thing about fear, right? When you look at fear through the right lens, it turns into excitement and it turns into, it's the same form of energy. If you talk to an athlete, yeah. I, I, think I saw a Simon Sinek video a little while back where he was interviewing an athlete or not he was interviewing, but a journalist was interviewing an Olympic athlete, hmm. literally. And the journalist was like, are you scared? But the athlete was like, no, I'm excited. And it's just the same conversation because it's the same form of energy. It's your relationship with it. But what I love about what you just said hmm. was that failing helps you become more confident mm -hmm. in the experiences you have, which is a really amazing way to see failure as almost like an asset. It's an asset you're building that just grows over time. So really, you just need to fail as fast as you can. And eventually, it was build up enough confidence to be okay with either making smarter mistakes or making less, more calculated ones. We, we learn best from those failures. So if everything you do is successful, then you're probably not challenging yourself enough and you're not reaching your true potential and you're not learning as much as you could. Yeah, yeah 100%, man. Now, you did also say something about fear, which I thought was really interesting. Do you think that fear in, in your own life, like the fear of starting something, if you don't know that fear exists, like sometimes fear will show up in my life as procrastination or mm -hmm. uh, maybe like a justification Stress. or uh, you know something, right? Stress. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know that it's fear showing up, how do you just do it? In other words, you're, you're putting off doing something you want to do and you don't know that it's actually because of fear. You're, you're really just, you're just coming up with all these excuses like, oh, I have too much of a busy schedule or I have too many things. I mean, because I love the, yeah. you're, that you're right. I mean, the only way to get through fear is to go do it. Right. But if you don't even know it exists, how are yeah. you going to train yourself to do it? It's a good point because I think a lot of people don't know it exists. I think people let themselves hold themselves back from a lot of things and make tons of excuses, and they don't call it fear. They, they say, they rationalize it and say, well, you know, it wouldn't be smart to do something like that, or it wouldn't be prudent, or I'm really stressed, I have to get this job done, or, you know, my boss will be mad at me, or, you know, what, whatever they do to justify it. By the way, stress, I, I brought that up because I was thinking of, uh, I went to a one-day workshop recently where Tony Robbins was, was speaking, and I forget exactly what he said, but I loved it. He said that stress is what ambitious people call fear. Right. So they, they dress, you dress it up. I mean, because at the end of the day, when you're stressed, you're like, oh, I'm really stressed. I got a lot of stuff to do. You're actually afraid that you're not going to get it all done and that your boss is going to be disappointed and you're going to be fired and you're not going to be good enough. And then you're going to be out on the streets. Right. You people like start to make those connections down the line when really it, it's probably going to be OK. You just need to prioritize and take care of what you need to take care of. So I think the first step is being really honest with yourself about what's going on, what you need to get done, what the ramifications are, and are you actually afraid of something or is it just a not a good idea? Is it just something you kind of want to do, but you don't have enough of a reason to do it? And if you are afraid of it, is it a justified fear? 
as in like, you know, walking down the street at night in the South side of Chicago is probably, you know, if you're afraid to do that, it's probably a justified fear because it's a dangerous place. Right. But if you're afraid to turn on the mic, you you really want to start a podcast, but you're not doing it because you're afraid of what people are going to say. And you're afraid someone's going to judge you poorly. Is that really a justified fear? Probably not because the chances of that happening are poor. And even if someone is out there listening and thinking, well, this guy, Raj, is, he's kind of boring. I don't really like this guy. <laughs> Who cares? Like, what? It doesn't affect you at all. Like, maybe, uh, you know, the worst case is they send you an email and they're like, I hate you. Yeah. Uh, what are the odds of that happening? And, you know, if you follow, uh, I love Gary Vaynerchuk. So if you follow Gary V, his advice on that is stop living your life for other people. Yeah. So, you know, so many people sit around and think, well, I'm not going to do this because one person might judge me poorly. So going back to your question, I think a lot of people are just not really honest with themselves about their situation. And I'm really big on living life intentionally, you know, doing what you really want to do and living the life you, the way you want to live it. And I think that starts with being honest about what your life situation, you know, why you are doing what you are doing, where you are. If you don't like your job and you're complaining about it, like you have a choice. Yeah. You know, chances are you live in a free country where you can go, you can leave your job and go do something else. It's not the case for everybody in the world, but for most people, that's the case, probably most of our listeners, right? So if you're unhappy with a situation, you do have a choice to change it. Now you might say, hey, I've got a wife, two kids and a mortgage, which is my situation, right? And therefore it would not be prudent for me to leave my job and take a chance to do this other thing. But that's still your fear. You're afraid that if you take a chance, it won't work out and that you'll be out on the street with your family. You got to recognize that and then decide what's the best course of action for you. Yeah, man, hundred percent. I couldn't even, I don't even think I can add anything to that if, uh, if I tried to, because you pretty much covered the entire gamut. And I think that, and what's fascinating, and I love that this is coming from, from you who, who works with so many high performing people. Do high performers have a different relationship with uncertainty? And how do they sort of view it? Do, they, do their learning patterns change when they're doing something new? Do they embrace the newness of it? Like, what is the attitude towards just doing things? I, you know, people do things for all different reasons. I think it's easy to assume that, quote, high performers, you know, people that are at the top that are, might be executives at a big company or successful entrepreneurs or speakers, coaches, whatever you're thinking about, uh, or athletes, that they might have such a different perspective on things. But they quite possibly could be operating out of fear as well, right? They're, they grew up with their parents telling them, you've got to get a job, go to a great school, become very successful. And they've been operating under that standard for years. And a lot of times people wake up, you know, at age 40 or 50 and, and go, wow, I built this great career and I'm making $200,000 a year, but I hate my job and my life. What the heck did I do? And that's not always the case, but it does happen for a lot of people. And they've been driven. And a lot of people on the outside look at them and say, wow, look at that big house and look at that car. They're really successful. And then those people oftentimes are, are driven by fear as well, right? Because then I've built this up. I don't really like it, but what do I do now? I can't give this up. I've, I've built this kind of persona that I'm a very successful person. And I, you know, if I quit and go travel in India for a year or something like I want to, then everyone's going to be like, what the heck happened to that guy? He went off the yeah. deep end, right? Everyone has the same fears. Yeah. So everyone has the fears of what are people going to think of me? What are my parents going to think of me? And if go, you know, study Tony Robbins, right? I think I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the two most common fears, everything goes back to, am I good enough? And will I actually be loved? Right. And so you think about what those things are and how those are driving people. Now, a lot of very successful people, when I think of success, you know, I think of people that are living life intentionally on their own terms with no regrets. Those people are doing the things that they want. They're learning all the time. They're embracing failure. So those are the people that I see as high performers, but it, it really depends on your definition, right? So if we go to, if, let, me, let me define high performers. And I guess yeah, people who consistently either create results or consistently do things that are either out of their wheel of comfort or things that just, I guess, fast adapters. I guess, yeah, fast, fast adapters, fast learners, yeah. high performers, I guess, in, in that category is where I'm- Doing different I'm, things. They're setting goals and, and going out there and achieving them, right? Yeah. I think those are the people that have taken the time to make the space to write down the things that they want to accomplish, to really think through those. 
and you know break them down into milestones and actually go out and achieve their goals they're probably willing most likely i think to ask for help to surround themselves there with is. other high achievers right yep. to hire a coach or join a mastermind group or just hang around with other uh, you know, if you're the startup scene in San Francisco, like you, it's normal that people are working around the clock and building something meaningful. So everybody wants to do that versus you're in another place where everybody hates their jobs and they're sitting around and drinking all the time. That's what it causes most people to do, right? So people often rise to the level of the peer group that surrounds them. So I think you find a lot of those high performers are like, you know, asking for help, but they're surrounding themselves with other high performers. And then they're finding more motivation to, you know, write down those goals, get help and actually, you know, parse those out and stay motivated and go out and achieve those things. Andy, when was the first time that you realized the power of experiential learning? For me, you know, I kind of very luckily fell into a job with a great consulting company called BTS. Started there in January, 2011. So about eight years ago, I um, have had a friend that worked there and he recruited me over and BTS is a, a Swedish company that builds experiential learning programs, business simulations for big companies. And uh, I, was, I say I was very lucky to get a job there because it's not that big of a company. I'd never heard of it before. But to get that job, it, it just fit all of the things I was looking for at the time, which was to work with a lot of different clients, learn about different businesses. I knew I was good in front of a room and I wanted to be able to speak, but I had no idea how to do that. And that job put me in front of executives, you know, traveling all over the world, facilitating these workshops. And I saw, I learned from being there that it was all about, it wasn't teaching. It was all about the experiences these executives were going through and that they learned best from that. So I learned it from being part of that company and then also, you know, going out. And as I went on a big mission to grow and get better myself, I'd say about two and a half years ago, I got really big into personal development and trying to figure out how to get more out of life. And I started going to conferences and workshops, seminars, and things like that, joining mastermind groups, and seeing how that experience accelerated my growth compared to just sitting at home and reading books like we talked about earlier. So I've seen it, you know, I was very lucky to, to fall into that, which is the business I've been in for the last eight and a half years on the corporate side, and then started trying doing different things on the personal front and seeing how that's worked for me. Yeah. How do you teach experiential learning? Well, I almost think they, those things are like, it's almost like a dichotomy because for me, experiential learning is people learning from experience and yeah. not, yeah, you know, they're not necessarily being taught. So, you know, if your question is, how do you teach, teach people self. to be more experiential about, about their learning approach? I guess that's a better way to say it, or even trust experiential learning versus which would be easier right now. The easier way would be to just consume, right? So how do you make someone trust experiential learning? Or how do yeah. you teach someone to start trusting those instincts? to Or, or, or change the lens, right? So you, you mentioned like yeah. the passive. There's a lot of people that are, that are comfortable sitting at home, reading books, watching YouTube videos, TED Talks, and knowing, you know, I can learn a lot from this. We've talked earlier about the power of failure, the growth mindset, about people learning from experience. If you think about, most of your life. I mean, you've probably learned a lot from books and things like that, but you've probably learned a lot more from experience, whether it's something you tried and failed in relationships and business, something else, or something people told you about that they tried to do. And, you know, I, I, I mentioned the sports metaphor earlier. If you're a sports fan, your favorite team practices a lot more than they perform in the big game. And they're learning from each of those and that's all experience, right? That's all experiential learning. And again, I would say this too. I go to a lot of conferences is one of my favorite things to do um, because I love connecting with people and learning there. I find a lot of times if you go to a conference, most of the content is probably available in some form in a book yep. or a speech, you know, a TED Talk or something somewhere, right? We live in an age now in late 2018 where information is available everywhere. It's not hard to get the information you need for anything. People pay for execution. And that's why people pay for coaches and other things. So they want to get better. And I go to conferences because when I'm there, when I'm immersed in it, when I'm surrounded by other people that are learning it, when I'm trying things, I'm writing down notes and I'm networking, talking to other people who are in similar situations, I learn so much more 
than when I'm sitting at home reading a book, which I still do. I read every single day, but I pay hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars to go to these conferences and seminars because I learn so much more and I I progress faster when I'm there, at least from my perspective. You're connecting dots. That's all you're really doing, right? So you're taking these different dots and different buckets of learning. And then with an experience, you're pulling from these different things and applying them so you can see how they feel in real life. It's almost like you know, you could be going to school and learning everything about engineering. And, but when you get out there and have an internship, that's how I was. I used to be an engineer mm. in my past life. And I remember my first internship, I learned more in three months yeah. being out there working. And everything then I was reading and learning made 10 times more sense. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, I, you know, a similar example, I, you know, I have an MBA and I learned a lot in business school, but then I got this job, this consulting job I mentioned at BTS where I was out on the, you know, in the field teaching finance to executives at big companies. I learned a ton more running these business simulations and teaching as part of this company than I did in, in, you know, two or three years in my MBA program where it was completely focused on business, but it was a lot more passive. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's amazing. I mean, so like I have this practice where I'll actually read like technical books, mm-hmm. whether it's like habit-based books, like, like mindset, whatever that is. Right. And then I also listen to books, but I'll listen to biographies or autobiographies. Hmm. And so one thing I'll do is I'll actually connect what I'm reading in a book to something that Arnold Schwarzenegger did when he was 16. I'll be like, oh, this is what he did there. And then I'll make that synaptic connection. And then when I go and actually execute, it gives more weight to that habit because now I can see it forming a pattern with somebody who's already successful. Yeah. So it's kind of cool that you can like connect these dots all across the board. Tell me about the most, I guess, accelerated learning experience you've ever had. I would say I went to, uh, you know, I mentioned I like go to like, I like to go to conferences and, and seminars. I went to a Tony Robbins seminar last year, Unleash the Power Within, which is a mm-hmm. four-day program that, that he runs. Yep. And the third day in particular on Saturday is called Transformation Day. It's a long day. And that man has more energy than anybody I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> 58 years old. And have you ever been to a Tony Robbins event? No, not yet. That's, I feel like it's been calling me a lot It's, it's more. incredible. I mean, the energy in the room. Um, but it, it's transformation day. And it's a lot of learning in one day, especially about yourself. And you can get most of that information. Again, like going back to what I said, Tony doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't hide anything between his books and all the videos online. You can get all that information at home. But being in a room surrounded by 1,000 other people who are also interested in improving their lives, making a transformation, learning at the same time, doing the exercises, dancing and jumping around in between, and you know, going through the exercises where he's having you close your eyes and basically meditate through this, where he's leading you through these transformations. It's life-changing and it's accelerated and it's you know way more impactful than what you're going to get from a book now that said again there's a lot of stuff you can learn from reading books his or any others and you can go out and practice yourself and you can make these improvements yourself but i think you know if you're looking at accelerated that's probably the most accelerated experience i've had yeah absolutely and i love that transformation day was your favorite yeah i'm just a, a nut when it comes to transformative experiences in general I love pushing myself to a limit to see how far I can go. And then it's, it's almost like an exhilarating. I feel like when you push yourself to the limit, yeah. you almost tap into this like additional reserve of brain power that you yeah. don't really know you have just because you're forced to survive in that sense. Right. Like, yeah. and so like when you're pushed to the brim of survival, not, not necessarily like I'm going to die kind of survival, but like right. in a sense where you're pushed to the brim of almost like social survival, you learn a lot about yourself, which then makes learning even faster. Totally. And that's all experiential as well, right? You're pushing yourself and you're experiencing that. What, what's been, I'm curious, what's an example of that? What's one of the times where you've really pushed yourself and had a, a transformation? Oh, well, I guess the mo- one of the most recent events gave like my biggest keynote in front of s- almost 1600 people. Wow. Before that, my biggest keynote was in front of, or his speech was in front of like a hundred. Okay. Um, that's big. So, yeah. That's a big jump. And I remember going on that stage and having that experience, it like transformed everything inside me because all the fear, all the nerves, everything that you have leading up to the event, like your mind plays these tricks and your mind creates these scenarios that might not be real. Right. uh, Or they might be really very, very, very real. 
But right. either way, it's not something that's experienced altogether. Yeah. And so when I got on stage, I feel like I learned about 10 years worth of lessons because I forced myself to do something that I had no idea I could do. Mm -hmm. And when I did that and I went up there and I did well, and then I got the social acceptance from the crowd right. that I did well, it was almost like the validation yeah. of that idea. And that validation then accelerated so much more because then I was teaching. So it was like that experiential for me, even though I wasn't at the conference to learn, yep. I learned everything about myself because I was on a stage that forced me to put on a different hat. Totally. And it forced me to show up as a different person that I honestly previously had never really been forced to show up as in my right. business, in my personal life, really any part of life. Right. And, and compare uh, that with sitting at home reading a book about how to speak, which it starts with, right? It, it's worth reading that book, but you'll never learn as much as when you go up there and give it a shot. And we talked about failure earlier. You might have bombed and you would have learned even more from that. Yep. Because you probably would have gotten, hopefully gotten feedback if you had a friend in the crowd was like, man, you should have done it this way, should have done it this way. And next time you'll do it better and then you'll be even better. Oh, trust me. My girlfriend was in the crowd. I got plenty of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I got plenty of feedback. Awesome. No, but it, it's, it's, it's goes back to that idea though. I think that there are so many things we can do to just learn quicker, learn faster, learn more and accelerate our own personal evolution through all of these concepts. Cause I think learning is, is such a fascinating, how do you get, how do you foster curiosity in your life? I think that I'm, I'm naturally curious. So maybe, but I think most humans are, I could be wrong about that, but I know I am naturally curious, but I have pushed myself on that by kind of making that one of my top values or tenets to say curiosity and staying hungry, which I call it, you know, hunger for growth is part of who I am. I've kind of made that part of my, my personality and my identity. And so I'm always wanting to learn from people. And that's why I started, you know, I host two podcasts. I started those because I can interview people and learn from them. And I'm always hungry to learn from others. And I have to tell you, quite honestly, it's funny. You know, I asked you that question about your experience. I, I'm having to hold myself back because I really want to just turn the tables and ask you questions. About what, <laughs> you know? But I know you're here to interview me. But it's because I love asking people questions and, and finding things out. And by the way, you know, for anybody listening that's, that's, you know, I'm talking about going to conferences to learn, but I love going to connect with other people, right? And build relationships. There's, you're talking about other people that were willing to make an investment and go there. And it's, you know, I, I think those relationships are so valuable. And the number one way, at least in my opinion, to go and connect with other people is to be curious and ask them questions and that you're going to learn about them and you're going to build that bond. So I just kind of keep that curiosity going at all times because I know that the best leaders, the most successful, business people, entrepreneurs typically are very curious and that's, um, that drives them. And especially as I've studied innovation as well, you look at the most innovative companies, they're often led by people who are very curious and that's, that drives their success. I mean, curiosity is almost one of the most contagious forms of energy, right? Like if you go up to someone and you act super curious, they get excited. Yeah. And then they start getting curious, maybe about themselves. They're like, huh, you know what? No one's ever asked me that. You kind of said, you said something about the podcast. I mean, to be honest, that's why I started my podcast. Yeah. Like in the very beginning, I started the podcast because I wanted to, I was meeting all these amazing people that I wanted to just learn from. Yeah. And then it, journey, it turned into this journey as I was asking more questions, as I was doing more, just came back. And it, it was like this self loop that just kept happening. And now it's, it's, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm resonating with you on a, on a whole new level right now. Um, I love it. Man. I love it. And then nice. you just keep learning and getting better and you're connecting with those people. And for anybody that's read how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie, classic book about building relationships, you know that everybody's favorite subject is themselves. And so when you're curious and you ask them questions, they're going to like you more. <laughs> it's actually how I've, I've found uh, most of my mentors. I, I found this out actually because I just turned 27. So I started, I guess, my business when I was 23 or something like that. And so remember when I first started out, I wanted to find mentors. And I realized that one, the young thing really worked with mentors because they like seeing a young guy who was really hungry. But when I got really curious about them, mm -hmm. they didn't even want anything in return. They just like, like, I keep asking me questions. Like they liked 
being asked questions. I guess most people just don't ask questions. It's amazing. A lot of people probably approach them and just make it about themselves and say, oh, hey, Raj, you know, I want to I want to ask you, how can how can you help me? I've got this situation. How can you help me instead of just saying, asking you questions about you and your life and your business and wanting to be, you know, authentically curious. People like that. Yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. Dude, I have so many questions. I'm trying to pick one that I want to ask you, though. What's your favorite book? And when did you start? You said you started reading two years ago, or you started really this journey for personal development two years yeah, ago. Yeah, I mean, I've been reading my whole life, but uh, yeah. Personal. What was, why did you start two years ago? Like, why two years? I mean, if you've been reading your whole life, why do you think yeah. your journey started two years ago? Oh, I can tell you exactly when that journey started. I'll tell you, I was a lot older than you are now. So you're, you're going to leg up with this, uh, where, where you are. I was 35. Uh, two and a half years ago, and you know, successful by many measures. You know, had an MBA, working for a consulting company, six figures. One, you know, married with one kid, another one on the way. You know, just didn't quite feel wanted more in a life. I just didn't know what it was. I had never been in, in, into any type of personal development. You know, read Tony Robbins or anything like that. And I was listening to a podcast about real estate investing, of all things. And I heard Hal Elrod, who I think mm. you have had on the show or Big you've fan. had. Yeah. And uh, I'm a super fan. I heard Hal Elrod talking about the Miracle Morning and I knew I had to give it a shot. And so I ordered that book. I started reading it the next morning. I think I ordered the physical book and I couldn't wait. You know, Amazon two days is not fast enough. <laughs> so I also bought the Kindle version and I, I got up at 4.30 the next morning and started reading it. And I have been doing the Miracle Morning every more every morning ever since. Pretty much, I did it 200 days in a row um, before I missed a day. And then, you know, pretty much every day since then, I've been doing some form of it. I've meditated pretty much 800 out of the last 802 days or something. And I exercise every day and I read every day. And that just that set me off on the journey. And then I started listening to other podcasts, reading books, learning different things, joining different groups. Um, but it all started with, with how I'll run in the miracle morning. So I am a super fan of him. And by the way, we were speaking of conference. The first time I went to a conference that was, you know, not a business conference, but like pay for it out of your own pocket for your own personal growth was yeah. I went to his, uh, best year ever blueprint event in San Diego in December, 2016. And that was life changing too. Not just not, not even really that much because of the content, but because of the relationships I made, I met so many awesome people at that event because who else was there 500 plus people or however many there were who were all interested in personal growth who wanted to live a better life who wanted to live the best life possible and help others around them that what a fantastic crowd you know if you go back to i guess the way we were as cavemen i mean we all just wanted to be in groups and accepted yeah I think that when you combine community with learning mm -hmm. um, it almost turns into this like superfood for just like growth just because you feel so supported yeah and when you feel that supported you feel invincible if you've ever um ever read the the book tribes by sebastian junger no i haven't it's a, it's a short book he talks about the history of civilization and how you know people were kind of meant to operate in tribes and be surrounded by groups of people that could support them and it was that when we moved into the more modern society that we have now where people lived on their own in big houses is separate from other people is when, you know, depression and suicide become much more prevalent. There's this need. I think we have a human need to be connected and be around other people. And you get some of that when you go to these conferences or you join certain groups that people have started and you get that regular bond. There's another book I was thinking of, The Blue Zones. I forget who wrote that, but uh, the guy who studied all these different, different societies where people live the longest like Okinawa and this island off the coast of Greece. And they, you know, the nutrition, they ate different things in different areas. But one of the most common things was that they stayed together as communities longer, that people lived with their families longer, you know, four generations in one house. I remember in Okinawa, the story of the, this woman who was like 105 years old and she still got together with her best friends every day to play cards and like talk, you know? And we just, we don't see that as much in our society, at least in the US. Mm. So to your point, I think it's just so important to find a tribe, find a group of people you can be around to support each other because we just, we can't, we can't do things on our own. It's no, tough. we're not designed to. Right. 
Exactly. We're not, we're not designed to. We were born and raised and built by the, the communities we're a part of. Mm-hmm. And if we've had that much of an influence just to where we are now, what makes us think we're going to be able to do anything moving forward without having communities by our sides? Yeah. Which is such a powerful, you know, and, and I think experiential, I think the reason I'm so interested in experiential learning is because it, it encompasses everything, right? It encompasses, and have you found that learning skills in one area of your life almost bleed into every area of your life? And are you able to sort of cherry pick the skills? Like, have you gotten better at picking which skills you want to learn because you've seen them compound in other areas of your life more? The methods for how I learn or the type of things that I want to learn, the things that I want to get better at? That second. Yeah. That's tough because when you go, you go down the road of personal development and you, and you get so curious and hungry for growth, then you notice all these areas are like, man, I, you know, I'm running a business, right? So sales, if, essentially I'm in sales. I want to get better at sales and building my business and I could be hyper-focused on that. But I'm also married and I have two kids and I want to be a better husband and father and I could read books all day about that. You know, I also want to improve my mindset and get better at coaching and get better at public speaking, you know, is something I was pursuing recently. There's all these things, you know, I'm, I, I need to get better at, you know, I'm pretty active on social media. I, I definitely could get a lot better in terms of how I'm using it and my presence to build my personal brand. That's something I could go and hire a coach and, and you know, read a bunch of books on. And uh, it gets tough, right? You got to kind of pick and choose. So I think the, the most important thing and what I try to do is you know, I always have a list of goals that I'm working on. I, I start with big goals at the beginning of the year and I break those down by quarter and I'm checking in with them regularly. I have a journal that I, I write in every single day to check in on the goals I'm working on. And I also use daily affirmations, which I started using when I started the Miracle Morning. And that reminds me of the goals I'm working on. And that helps me prioritize the things that I want to do and the things I want to get better at. Now, that's not to say that you might not throw out a book or, you know, a, a conference or something that you love. And I'll be like, oh man, that sounds awesome. And I'll go buy it. Yeah. Um, but most of the time I'll try to focus in and say, okay, yes, I could go and learn and read all these other things. You know, I'm subscribed to probably 50 or more podcasts right now, if I look at my phone, but what are the things I'm trying to get better at right now? I'm going to try to focus in and spend my learning time on those things because I know that by getting better at those things, it will hopefully support every other area of my life and help me get better in those areas too. So we got to kind of pick and choose. The other way is you could just kind of move around and, and do different things. Two questions. How much time do you spend learning every day? Not enough. I typically read for, you know, 20, 30 minutes in the morning. And then the other things... I don't, I guess I don't have any other dedicated learning time, but I'm talking to people all the time. Yeah, you're I'm, always podcasts. I'm, I'm always asking people questions. I'm occasionally looking up articles and things like that. But as far as dedicated, I've got the, like I said, 20 or 30 minutes every morning when I'm reading. And then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm occasionally going to conferences and, and learning that way too. You're a perennial learner. Perennial learner. Yeah. I haven't heard of that. I like it. Yeah. The second thing. So you have goals in business family, let's say personal ambitions, yeah. bucket lists. Definitely. One thing in, in this year, let's just talk this year, not yeah. previous years, F- but finishing off 2018. Yeah. Finishing off 2018. What's the one thing that you've dedicated to learning that has helped you improve across the board? I will say, I want to say my mindset and my confidence. That's kind of what my mind goes to because having a kind of a breakthrough there having the mindset that, you know, I'm on this trajectory, I need to go after these goals. I don't need to worry as much about what other people think about what I'm doing and having the confidence to go after the things that I want to do, the the goals I want to pursue has allowed me to make, to take more chances, to try different things, going back to what we talked about earlier and learn a lot and make progress much faster. And that flows into every area of my life, you know, business, family, um, that sort of stuff, and just keeping that open mind and and learning all the time. But I think it's been that that switch. I hired a coach for a short amount of time. I don't remember when it was, but I think it was earlier this year. And he definitely helped me make a a really good flip when it comes to my mindset, especially with stuff I'm putting on social media. 
And uh, it helped a lot. Dude, that's awesome. So simple, right? It comes back to investing in your mind, the -hmm. way you feel about yourself, the way you view yourself. That almost seems to just fix everything. (laughs) Like, it can, right? I mean, the, if you have the right mindset and the confidence and you're able to go out and build relationships, there's kind of like no limit to what we can accomplish. It's amazing. And I'm almost, I grew up with a, I'm very lucky that my dad taught me a lot about finances and investing. And I used to invest a lot into like retirement, you know, like you're supposed to do. But I'm to the point where I think it's more important to invest in yourself and personal development than in retirement savings because it's just going to keep paying off or you keep getting better. Your earning potential goes up higher. Your fulfillment is greater and you're probably going to work a lot longer than we used to anyway. So especially if you find something you enjoy doing. You're the biggest source you can bet on. I've always believed that I'd rather double down on myself than any other investment on the planet. And especially if you keep investing in mindset, just because you just keep thinking the horse is more valuable over time and you start to treat it that way. When you start to treat yourself like the most valuable horse in the room, Unstable, I guess, because horses don't go in rooms. But I don't know. Where. <laughs> it's good. It's a really valuable horse, dude. I would put it in a room. I would give it a house. Oh my gosh, man! No, I just I love the idea that uh, just investing in yourself is 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 just it's an addicting thing to do. Um, it totally is, and it's still hard, uh, even for me. You know, I'm considering a couple of big investments right now, and like a new new course and group I'm thinking about joining that's really expensive. And uh, you got to be prudent, but as I'm talking to you, I'm like, man, I need to do more of this stuff because it just well, keeps paying off. You know, I think that uh, prudent, I don't know if I would use the word prudent. I need to be selective. Right. Um, you got to be selective. Yeah. To your point earlier, like, how do you choose? You can get overwhelmed. You can do too much. I could sign up for five different classes and go to a conference every week. I met a guy actually when I was at that best year ever event. I met this guy, I talked to him afterwards and I was like, and he, he, he went overboard with this, right? So you can go too far. And uh, I was like, yeah. how many conferences do you go to this year? And he's like, oh, I went to like 50. And I'm like, dude, do you even remember half of them? It's like, not really. It's yeah. Too much. Then at that point, you're kind of just replacing your subconscious, like or your conscious environment with conferences yeah. and, because you can't match that level of energy. And that becomes very dangerous and very right. unsustainable because I've actually been there myself. I think this yeah. year alone, man, I've probably, I was actually looking at my calendar. I've been away for almost 120 days this year at events, masterminds, learning experiences and different things. And that doesn't even, that doesn't even count the dedicated learning time. To to go back to our, what we talked about earlier with experiential learning and practice, you know, when you read or whatever, you've got to put things into practice, right? And if you're constantly going to those things, you don't give yourself time to go practice it, to go do it, to implement it and see how it works out before you move on to the learn the next thing. And then you forget the last one. Yes, man. Speaking the same language, but dude, Andy, you, um, you are an enlightened soul, my man, and I am grateful to have been able to dive into the mind of somebody who is such a passionate learner and so obviously curious just about the human experience and how to have the most amazing one. I just want to thank you again, man, for taking the time to, to be here and, and share your wisdom with the listeners and just inspire us to be more. Thank you, Raj. I mean, this has been, this has been a fun conversation for me, and it's always great connecting with other enlightened souls, as you say, people who live life with ambition and hunger and curiosity and gratitude. And I love being around people like you and I hope we get to keep in touch and talk more. Absolutely. Now I have one last question for you. So in the midst of everything you've been through, everything you've learned and everything you continue to learn, Mm -hmm. how do you stay grounded? How do I stay grounded? Well, for me, I mentioned I'm married. I have two children. My kids give me purpose. And really everything I do in life is for them and the legacy I'm leaving. I see them when I'm not traveling. I do travel a decent amount, but um, I see them almost every day. And they remind me what life is about and keep me kind of grounded to where I need to be. If I'm I'm going too far in one direction, I think about, well, how is this going to impact them? How does this impact our life as a family? And that keeps me grounded and keeps me back, takes me back to where I need to be. And then beyond that, I also, I mentioned I I meditate every day and I think that keeps my mind (laughs) a little bit grounded and keeps me calm throughout all the craziness that goes on. For sure. No, I uh, always believe that if you if you're sacrificing one area of your life to win in another, you're just borrowing success. You're actually not sure. building an asset that can be sustainable for a very long yeah. time. So you just, you just sum that up. Andy, my man, thanks again for 
just dropping a bunch of knowledge. For everybody who wants to get in touch with Andy, we'll make all of his contact information available, including his, ad- including his address, his phone number, and nice. everything. So, social security number, put that yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> picture your passport. Um, right. No, no, no. But yeah, we'll, we'll definitely uh, make, make, Andy, make Andy's awesomeness available to everybody. But uh, thanks again, man. I really appreciate you just taking the time. Yeah, thank you, Raj. I, I am grateful for the opportunity. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Well, everybody, that is a wrap for this week's episode of Stay Grounded. I'm your host, Raj, and this is your friend, Andy. And from us, Stay Grounded. Talk to you soon. Thanks for joining us today on this episode of Stay Grounded. I hope you found this interview helpful as you create your own ways to live an extraordinary life. For more resources and support, please visit www.rajjana.com forward slash stay grounded to join the official Stay Grounded Facebook group, a place where aspiring life enthusiasts can connect and ignite passion for life together. My hope is that the positivity, content, resources, and support in this group will resonate with you on a deeper level. That what you hear in our podcast, read in our thoughtful posts, or learn in our courses will empower you to live with intention, uncover true purpose, and challenge the internal dialogues that stop you from being who you really want to be in your life. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Stay grounded.